Good morning. As in most controversial topics, where people feel comfortable entrenched on opposite sides, surrounded by others who believe as they do, the truth and reality usually lies somewhere in between. The issue is more complicated than a yes or no answer. Never more so than on the question of abortion. There are ethical, moral, legal, scientific, and scriptural aspects that is not as clear as most people would like, causing each one of us to make our own judgments based our, on our best interpretation of the facts. We're going to approach this over the next couple of weeks from four points of view. Scripture, experience, science, and tradition. This week, we're going to take a look, a deep dive, and take a look at Scripture. We'll cover the other three next week. For Christians, the Bible is naturally the first place they go whenever they have a complicated question, as it's the primary authority for many Christian traditions. However, we must remember that the Bible, in all its complexity, is not initially written to answer our 21st century questions, but to tell the story of God the God of Israel, and to testify how that same God was revealed in Jesus the Christ. Its many authors were most concerned with relaying those truths, helping their people in their time and place to interpret God and how God was working in their world in their experiences of the community and experiences of their own life and circumstances that they were going through at that time. Most of the books were written for a specific reason to a specific group of people in response to circumstances on the ground in that place and time. This makes it much harder to proof text a single or selected verses out of context to prove a particular point. Proof texting is when you find and use a verse or selection of verses to support a belief you already hold that's not backed up by the original meaning most likely intended by the author based on their context. This is not to say that scripture is not relevant to the debate on abortion. Many anti-abortion activists are driven by their Christian faith, stating their convictions as a right to life, and life beginning at conception. In language of faith they talk, rather than political language. They appeal to the Bible more often than they appeal to the Constitution, and the right to privacy that was formed the basis for the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. Likewise, we'll see that there are pro-choice activists who also use the scriptures pulled out of context to show that God directs abortions and the killing of unborn under certain circumstances. So, it can't be that bad not the killing of unborn. They say, well, the fetus is not yet a fully developed person. If we're reading the same Bible, how can there be faithful Christians who are both anti-abortion and pro-abortion rights? The difference lies in how we approach the authority of the Bible and through which lens we read it. The reality is that the vast majority of the people are somewhere in between the extremes. Only a, a very few are absolutely no abortions whatsoever under any circumstances. 
Likewise, it's only a very small minority that believe a woman should have the right to terminate a pregnancy at any time for any reason right up to the moment of delivery. So let's see if we can find some common ground there in the middle where most people are. Let's first address some of the individual verses that many Christians who are what's commonly termed as pro-life use to support their position. Namely that from the moment of conception an embryo is a human being and contains a soul and therefore makes abortion akin to murder. Often when having a discussion with a person opposed to abortion, the first line of scripture that they will quote is the part of Psalm 139 that was our first scripture reading. For it was you who formed my inward parts, says the psalmist. You, speaking to God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. This is a, a beautiful and amazing section of a wonderful psalm. It's a prayer and a poem characterized by both a lament and a prayer for deliverance from one's enemies. It also ends, by the way, with a plea for God to kill the wicked and that the bloodthirsty will depart from me. Like many of the Psalms, it contains a range of human emotions and language to communicate the truth that God is a personal God who knows each one of us intimately, loves us deeply, and has a plan for us. The New Testament corollary might be uh, Jesus in Luke 12, 7 telling the crowds, but even the hairs on your head are counted. Do not be afraid. You are more valued than the sparrows. Quoting Psalms literally, rather than reading them like the prayer or poem that they are, or hymn book that they are, the hymn book of ancient Israel, it does a great disservice to the Psalms and how we interpret Scripture. If we take that passage literally, we should also then take Psalm 137.9. When the psalmist prays for vengeance, happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Even when speaking of our enemies, Christians usually don't advocate killing children. Anti-abortion Christians also turn to Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5, which contains similar language about how God knowing an individual before she or he was even in the womb. In Jeremiah it reads, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I anointed you a prophet of the nations. Again, this language can be interpreted as the author using a, a, a rhetorical device to emphasize Jeremiah's selection as a prophet. Like the passage in Psalm 139, these verses from Jeremiah read in context say more about the all-knowing and all-loving characteristics of God than they say about the personhood of an embryo or fetus in the womb. Additionally, applying these verses broadly to every individual, born and unborn, is reading something into the text that simply is not there. Certainly God has not appointed everyone a prophet to the nations. Rather, these verses specifically apply to Jeremiah and his mission and vision as a prophet of God. Using this verse uh, from Jeremiah, you could also ask, was Jeremiah a person before he was even formed in the womb? 
That's what the scripture says. God knew him before he formed him in the womb. When I was a kid in Catholic school I went to taught that if we masturbated sin, it was a sin. Because we're spilling out God's seed for potential human beings. I wonder what would have been the reaction if that teaching had permeated the ruling class who made the laws in this country and it had become illegal to masturbate. Would there be millions of men protesting for their rights? It sounds ridiculous, but that's what happens when you take scripture out of context. Now let's look at our second reading from Numbers. Pro-choice advocates have used this verse to show that not only does the Bible not outlaw abortions, in fact, we're told to administer the ancient version of the morning after pill to ensure there's no pregnancy if a woman had sex with someone other than her husband. Not only are they directed to cause her to have her period, but it seems like based on verse 28, after the procedure, she would be barren, unable to bear children. I have no doubt that infidelity to one's spouse is also unfaithfulness to God. But this punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime, even for a just God. This verse does not advocate for forced abortions in the case of marital unfaithfulness. It's in the same chapter where they tell people to put all women who are going through their period outside the city because they're unclean. The procedure mentioned in our reading can even be done if there were no witnesses and no one to prove the wife had become unfaithful. Her husband just has to have the spirit of jealousy to have her go to the priest for this process. This passage shouldn't be applied to our world today. It's a product of a patriarchal and misogynistic culture of ancient times. So the pro-choice people can't use this scripture to say God is okay with abortions. In an interesting twist, both sides take Exodus 21, 22 through 25 out of context, claiming that it shows an unborn fetus has equal status with a person, and others reading the same scripture claiming that it shows it does not have equal status. Listen to what it says. When people who are fighting injure a pregnant woman, so there is a miscarriage, yet no further harm follows, the one responsible shall be fined what the woman's husband demands, paying as much as the judges determine. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, and wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, of course, miscarriage and abortion are two different things. Yet the primary claim against abortion is that life begins at conception. The fetus is a person with a right to life. So why is this penalty for a miscarriage in a fight only a fine? Which, by the way, they have to pay to the husband, not the woman they injured. Again, context is critical for interpreting any scripture. This is in a section concerning laws against violence. A few verses prior to this, it says, whoever curses their father or mother shall be put to death. If that were meant to be applied literally, there'd be a lot less children around the world today. We could go on and on, researching more than 10 different scholarly sources from both sides of the argument. There were no clear-cut passages in Scripture either way. 
A word search for the word abortion in scripture shows that it is not specifically mentioned at all. Even the word miscarriage is mentioned only twice in the Hebrew scriptures and not at all in the New Testament. However, there are plenty of examples of killing unborn children in their mother's womb, often at God's direction, sometimes towards Israel's enemies, and sometimes done to Israel by their enemies at the will of God. So while Christians on either side of the abortion debate may disagree on the precise meaning of individual verses, and even on how we read the Bible, we still share a belief in Jesus Christ and in Scripture as the revelation of God. Similarly, while we also disagree on the moral standing of a developing prenatal child, we do share a common grounding in the Bible. We can read the Bible story together as a pro-life story, as a testimony to the pro-life character of God. Looking at the biblical ark, we can agree across the aisle that God is for life over death, for freedom over slavery, for human flourishing over all kinds of oppression social, legal, political, economic, and religious. Creation, liberation, relationship, salvation, and the resurrection are fruits of God's power. We see these fruits in Jesus' ministry as he restores people to health, not just in body, but in spirit and community as well. What stronger statement can be made in favor of life than God's raising Jesus from the dead? Evidence of God's power of life over death. And through Christ, we are all made truly alive. In John's Gospel, Jesus promises not just life, but abundant life. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Life in God is not merely existence, breathing and having a beating heart, but meaning and purpose and blessing. Abundant life is about flourishing. However, this is not the end. In the decisive relation, revelation of God's pro-life character, Jesus is raised from the dead resurrected not resuscitated the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty death has been destroyed no longer having any power after jesus's ascension into heaven he is no longer with the disciples they receive the gift of the holy spirit we share in common ground the resurrected christ and the promise of abundant life in him like the psalmist in Psalm 139, we believe that God intimately knows and loves all of God's creation, that we can't escape that love no matter where we go or what we do. We also agree that even as the kingdom of God was partially inaugurated with the resurrection, we still live in a sinful and fallen world full of tragedy and heartbreak. The kingdom of God has not been fully established, so everywhere we turn, we see brokenness. We all read scripture through a certain perspective, born mostly from our communal or individual experiences. We bring our own questions, experiences, and theology to the text which leads us to certain stories and verses and even books that we prefer over others. No matter whether we identify as pro-choice or pro-life, there's no such thing as an unbiased reader. As Christians, we're taught to read the Bible, even the Hebrew scriptures, 
through the lens of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's pro-life action through Christ trumps other stories when God has been the dealer of death such as the tenth plague when all the firstborn in Egypt were struck down. Because it's part of God's plan for the salvation of the world. The political realities of our day tell us that being pro-life and pro-choice are incompatible. But as Christians, we should all be pro-life in favor of that abundant life Jesus came to give us. We see the hallmarks of that abundant life in Jesus' ministry of feeding and healing and his example of loving God and loving neighbor. Through our baptisms, we are baptized into that ministry as well. But when we look around at our communities, around our world and we see suffering we see children who go to bed hungry schools without adequate resources and families who work hard and still struggle for the basic necessities we see a world at war at home in our communities where gun violence is prevalent and abroad We're so far from the kingdom that Isaiah prophesies when he says, The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. That child, Jesus, is leading us, but we're not there yet. And an abundant life for women includes being able to plan her family with her partner. And having access to health care helps them do so. Both pro-choice and anti-abortion Christians can see abortion as a tragedy while acknowledging the economic realities that require women to choose between parenting another child and making a living. However, many who call themselves anti-abortion also fight access to affordable contraception, which calls into question whether this fight is really about birthing children or controlling women's bodies. Some states even have laws that criminalize women who use drugs while pregnant lowering the chance that these women are going to seek out health, help and health care they so desperately need. Women terminated pregnancies before Roe versus Wade and they'll continue to seek abortions if it's ever overturned. The issue is whether these abortions will be safe, accessible, particularly for women on the margins and with few resources. A pro-life ethic based on God's action in Scripture demands that we consider the fullness of life from birth to death, the possibility of human flourishing and not just human existence. While we cry because of the tragic nature of abortion, vilifying women for their choices, in many cases this is born out of other ways in which our world is broken and sinful. Being pro-choice is not an automatic rubber stamp for abortions. But we are naive if we fail to acknowledge the consequences of outlawing abortion on the health and well-being of half of the population. Next week, will examine life experiences, both communal and individual, that support not getting an abortion, as well as others that affirm the opposite. Additionally, we'll look at the sciences that were created by God to ask when that cluster of cells 
that is in sperm and an egg attached to the uterine wall change from embryo to fetus to infant. Finally, we'll discuss ensoulment. When is the moment this cluster of cells gets a soul? Looking at church tradition, we'll see that some famous early church theologians, Christian church theologians, thought it was 40 days after conception for a male and 90 days for females. Let us pray. Oh Lord, there is a lot to digest in this question, in this issue. Let us be open to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Let those that are for a woman's right to choose respect those that are against it. Let those who hate abortions realize that many who are pro-choice also believe it's a tragedy and want to do everything in their power to limit the amount of time that it happens. Let us find your love in Scripture. Let us find how to love our neighbor amongst, amidst this challenging conversation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.